the blue glove and the doctor the surgical doctor have the like not the the, the, the same uh, color maybe they have the white one or the the, the, the the yellow one i think so what what difference is that so are you saying that the surgical nurse had blue gloves like the one given the tools or oh. was yeah, the doctor, they have a different color of the glove. Well, if they're doing what they should be doing, the surgical nurse who's in charge of the tools and the surgeon should be having those white sterile gloves on. They should yeah. have the blue because the blue gloves are not considered sterile gloves. That's your typical gloves that you would find in any room anywhere else. So if they're using those during a surgery case, that is a big no-no. Big no-no. I've never seen sterile gloves blue colored, at least not in my career. So that's a little concerning if they're using that during a, during a sterile surgery case. Don't do that in real life. It's not gonna work out so well. Well, son, did you see anything cool in surgery yesterday? What kind of case did you get to see? Can't hear you, son. Yeah, yesterday I uh, I go different room, a uh, three room of surgical. Uh, the, the one room for the uh, like the right shoulder, the fibula, mm -hmm. and um, one room the other side like left fibula, and the last one for the uh, kidney surgical. Oh, you have to see a kidney surgery. Yes. So when they, they do on that, were they removing stones or were they doing something else? Uh, maybe they move the no, they cut it. I I think they they just make the they they use the uh, ultrasound too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I when I was a student, my very first rotation was surgery, way back twelve years ago. My very first rotation was surgery, and I got to go in on a kidney surgery, and they were doing. Um, what was called a lithotripsy, and it was a laser lithotripsy. Lithotripsy is where they use lasers to break up the stones in the kidneys, and they turn them into a powder so that they can be digest, uh, removed properly without causing pain to the patients. Anyway, it was quite fascinating if you ever get to see a lithotripsy because you look almost like you're out of something from Star Wars because you put these big white goggles on, these big white suits to protect yourself from the lasers. Everyone looks like stormtroopers, essentially, from Star Wars. It's kind of cool. If you have, um, you'll probably see that at least once, but we do get called into those lithotripsies every once in a while. Pretty cool to watch, pretty fascinating. They'll, they'll do a very fine point laser. They'll go like, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, like this, it makes this noise, like doo -doo 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 -doo, real fast like that. And it's breaking up those stones, turning, turning them into a powder. And you have to wear those protective goggles because the laser can actually blind you during the surgery. Really neat stuff, really neat stuff. Okay, did anybody else see something cool yesterday? I wanna hear a couple more stories. All right, I mean, it doesn't have to be exciting. You just talk about doing your first chest x-ray if you wanna talk about that. I wanna hear about anything and everything. What happened yesterday? Somebody tell me something. Oh, I had like two patients from prison. I thought that was kind of cool. Oh, you got to do prisoners. <laughs> How'd that go? It was pretty cool, but I, don't, I didn't get to like touch them. So I just like pressed the button to expose the x-ray. But that was really it. But they, the tech wouldn't let you help directly or what happened? I don't, it was like, it was like, okay, so he was moving like really fast. So I was like, you know what, since it's a prisoner patient, I'm gonna let you handle this. I'll <laughs> take the cassette, put it in the thing and scan it and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of prisoners, guys, especially throughout Harris Health. Prisoners come in all the time. You see them in those big orange jumpsuits. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll come marching in and because. it can be quite uncomfortable sometimes because, you know. It's uncomfortable when they remove the handcuffs. Yeah, yeah. But the police was there, right? The police stayed in the room? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the to. yeah. I got a funny story about that. This happened at my first job when I was still living in Lake Charles. And I was working the overnight shift and we had some prisoners come in. 
I was doing some x-rays of their orbits, which is around the eyes right here, because he'd got punched in the face and had a fracture of the orbits. So I got done doing his x-ray, and for some reason, the police officer didn't handcuff him whenever he left the room. So he went into the changing room without handcuffs. And, and um, long story short, the prisoner took off running out of the dressing room down the hallway, out the hospital, and disappeared for like three hours. They didn't catch him. Well, I don't know what happened in between, but it turns out they ended up finding him going to his, his wife's house, his spouse's house, and his kids, and they caught him there. And they just said, I'm sorry, I just wanted to see my family again. But they ended up handcuffing him and arresting him and bringing him back into jail. But I remember after that was all over, they actually came to me and did an interrogation of me wanting to know if I had anything to do with taking the handcuffs off and leaving them off. I'm like, dude, I was just taking the pictures. I don't even have the key to these handcuffs. What are you talking about? So <laughs> I didn't get in trouble. But once again, the importance of documenting everything you see, because you never know what you're going to be blamed on. I had everything properly documented, so they couldn't actually accuse me of anything because of my proper documentation. But they did try to blame me for it even though it was clearly the cop's fault. But yeah. So how will you document that? Like you said that the <laughs> prisoner came in without handcuffs? Um, crazed, crazed prisoner took off running down the hall after I took the x-ray. Now, I just basically documented from step one, you know, officer removed handcuffs prior to exam, perform procedure, handcuffs were not placed back on patient after the conclusion of exam. Uh, patient ran out the hospital. I just went through the whole the whole event, basically put it in the computer system. But um, yeah, let's see. For the most part, it's weird to have prisoners in society at all. But hey, <laughs> I'm just typing more. I want to make sure I'm clear. I just think it's strange to lock people in in uh, cells and everything. But of course, that's not our our right. purpose of conversation not here. I'm just throwing it out there that I I couldn't imagine. I mean, I'd probably want to escape to pretty human nature but yeah good to know what to do in those situations so glad y'all share most definitely most definitely so quick question so yeah the, sure so the police they're not in like the restrooms with while the um prisoners are like changing well that's just it they were supposed to be and they're mm -hmm. doing what he's supposed to be doing oh okay louisiana guys it's a whole nother world it's um when I say the phrase Louisiana is kind of like its own country, it really is because things are just weird there. Trust me, I grew up there most of my life. All kinds of crazy stuff going on. So that's not very surprising that that happened. Don't worry, lots more stories where that came from. I got all kinds of crazy stories from my career and Louisiana especially. Just wait till we get to barium enemas. I got a very funny story on barium enemas. If you don't know what that is yet, you'll know very quickly. All right, any, uh, one more story, guys. Anybody else got something interesting that happened yesterday? Oh. Um, I saw a barium swallow. Um, it was pretty interesting to see how you can see the contrast moves with them. The oh, so you, saw it, you saw it going down the esophagus into the stomach? Mm -hmm. Was it just a barium swallow or did it have an upper GI with it as well? No, it was just a, a barium swallow. But Very it, cool. How, how are you liking flora overall? Um, I'm really enjoying it. Like I'm getting able to see, well, yesterday I was more involved. Um, what is they, well, I mean, it's not big, but they allowed me to put the uh, patient's information in the monitors. So where the doctor is able to see the, the arthrogram. Um, it was just like little things that I, that I get in, that I didn't get to experience on Tuesday that I got to experience on Thursday. So did you get to actually be involved with the patient as far as positioning them and moving them around during the procedure or? No, not that. No, they have you're, still, you're still in there though? Yes, I am. Because most of the time, like you'll have the barium, you'll have them drink the barium, you'll hand it to them, things like that. You'll be involved with getting that patient, um, drinking all that wonderful tasty barium throughout the whole process. Um, I am gonna say they might, uh, well, my text said that she uh, has her students taste the the chalky thingy, <laughs> and uh, and she said that she just makes them taste it. So whenever the patient asks you, like, what does it taste like, you won't be like, oh, I don't know, but she says that she does have her students 
Tasty. That is so funny because I used to do the same thing when I worked at Texas Children's to the students, just to all appreciate what it tastes like. And it's not, it's not the worst thing. Did you try it, by the way? Did you drink it? No? Um, it's not the worst. No, I got saved because it was time for me to go. <laughs> it's not the worst tasting thing in the world. If you ever had milk of magnesia, it's very similar to the taste of milk of magnesia or um, like any of those medicines you drink for acid reflux. Very similar tasting. So she described it as like whenever you go to the dentist and after you're done, they put the whole little orange thing on your teeth. She said that it tastes something like that, that that's how it feels. Yeah, it's very thick and very chalky as well. Yeah, um, what we used to do at Texas Children's for the kids, because if you can imagine getting kids to drink that, it's a nightmare. We would actually always have a uh, container of Hershey's chocolate syrup on standby and we would mix it into the barium and we'd tell them we're making them a chocolate milkshake. And it, it didn't take all the taste away, but it, it helped. It was, you know, psychology, work with the psychology, the chocolate milkshake, a lot better than saying, here's some barium, drink it. You know, try telling that to a four-year-old. It's not going to work out too well for you. But that is um, that's what we always used to do, put that chocolate syrup in there. It helps a little bit. It helps a little bit. But very cool, guys. Are, uh, is it still feeling good to be in there getting that hands-on? Starting to feel pretty good? actually getting to interact with your patients and do it in real life? Is it starting to click a little more outside of lab? Did anybody do something besides a chest x-ray, like any extremity work, since we'll be talking about that very soon? What did you, what did you do, Esbede? Uh, we do a lot of hands and, um, we also did foot, like lower, but we did a lot of hands, fingers, um, forearm. It's a little different in there, they do a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you guys have been, did you guys start that in lab this week? Yes? Yes, we started yesterday. Very good. Very good. Oh, by the way, if anyone is going to lab, um, I was wearing a long sleeve, my mistake. Um, the air conditioner in the lab does not work. So if anyone is going to lab today, make sure you don't take like a long sleeve. It's not working. They have to open oh. the door. It's really hot. Thank you for that. Thank you for the heads up. It's very hot in there. I've been in there when the air conditioner goes out, it gets very hot. Thank you for the warning. That is a very good piece of advice. Yes, prepare to sweat. I'm so sorry. Maybe it'll be fixed by the time you get there today. Who knows? Let's see what happens. All right, guys, so let's jump right back into it. We got through talking about ossification and bone classification on Wednesday. And today we're gonna to dive into the wonderful world of arthrology. I'm gonna get a little more detail than we talked about at the beginning of last semester. Um, let me get this PowerPoint pulled up. <clears throat> Let me get your faces all above me here. Okay. So arthrology, everybody, this very first slide should look a little bit familiar because we did talk about these last semester. Let's do a brief review of our structures and our functions of the three main classifications of joints. Of course, first we have those fibrous joints. Simply means that it is held together by a fibrous tissue. The main quality of function for that joint type is that it is what's called synarthrodial, which refers to something that is completely immovable. So these joints, their key characteristic is they're holding joints together via those fibrous tissues, but they're going to be completely immovable. In fact, we don't want these to move. If you remember the example I gave last semester, I said you'll often find these fibrous joints in your skull, the skull sutures. Obviously, we don't want our skull bones moving around. If they are, we've got a major problem. It's going to be completely immovable or synarthrodial joints. The second main type are going to be what we call the cartilaginous joints simply means they're held together by cartilage, and they're gonna be what we call amphiarthrodial amphi functions, which means a limited amount of movement. So not an extreme amount of movement, but it does give a little to allow some movement. And the main quality of cartilaginous joints is that they're gonna create more of a padding, a padding for our joints, such as the spine. The spine would be what we call those cartilaginous, cartilaginous joints, gonna help protect that spinal cord and cushion those vertebrae together so they're not rubbing up against each other. Our spine, as you know, we can bend forward, we can bend backwards, side to side. 
that's that limited amount of movement we're talking about. And finally, that third and final category would be the synovial joints. We will spend a lot of time on synovial joints because there are quite a few classifications under synovial joints that we have to review today. Synovial joints, they're characterized by having an actual synovial fluid in the joint capsule, and they're what we call diarthrodial. That means they are freely movable. So we talk about our humerus and shoulder, that's a synovial joint, the knees, the ankles, the elbows, the wrists, those are all types of synovial joints because we've got that free range of motion. We can move in 360 degree movements. So make sure you do remember those three structural types as well as those three functions of each. Commit those to memory. These are gonna reemerge through every chapter moving forward throughout all of our Rad Pro classes. We're gonna talk about all these joints in detail as we come across them in the upper extremities, in the spine, in the skull, so on and so forth. And Amy, I think I heard you say a second ago that you did a, an arthrogram in fluoro. So an arthrogram in fluoro, what she was referring to is a fluoroscopy exam where they're going to do what's called injections into the joints. And most of the time they're going to do those injections in those synovial joints that we're talking about right here. As you see right there, that key quality is that it has synovial fluid. Some people lose that synovial fluid and they'll get those injections to help free up those joints and allow them to be able to move properly. Because if you lose the synovial fluid, you're gonna lose that range of motion in those synovial joints. And that actually occurs in all ages. We've done, I've done a lot of those on children as well as elderly patients. A lot of people think it's only on elderly people, but it does happen with children as well. Okay, so let's talk about fibrous joints for a second here. Once again, a few examples would be the fibers that are between the tibia and the fibula right at that ankle joint. That is considered a fibrous joint. It's held together by fibers and it's not gonna move at all. The biggest example, of course, are our skull sutures. Sutures in the skull are these lines you see going across the skull here. No, I do not expect you to label these quite yet. That's next semester, but do make sure you know that the sutures in the skull are considered fibrous joints. Obviously, we don't want those to move around. If it was moving around, guess what's gonna happen? Our skulls are gonna become disconnected and our brain's gonna become exposed. We need those to stay fused together to keep our skulls safe. And then the roots of the teeth. The roots of the teeth are actually held together by those fibrous joints. And I don't know about you, but the last thing I want is my teeth moving around my mouth because guess what? If my teeth are moving around, they're gonna fall out I'm gonna lose my teeth and have to get false teeth. So we want that to be secured nice and secured by those fibrous fibers, held in the place and not be moving at all, held in place completely by those fibrous joints. Definitely remember those skull sutures as being a very prime example of those fibrous joints. And there's just another closer look at those sutures right there. Whoops, let me take my drawings off here. Those sutures are holding those parts of that skull together. They have to fuse together. And one thing you'll realize in pediatrics, if you've ever been around a baby and felt their skull, you know that there's soft parts on the skull. That's what we call fontanelles, it's cartilage. And as the child grows older, that, those fontanelles shrink and begin to fuse and form those fibrous joints. That's why with babies and children, we're always so concerned about head injuries because they don't have that fused skull as of yet. And if they do sustain a head injury, guess what they're in danger of hurting? Their brain, because the brain's essentially exposed. It's only got a little bit of cartilage there covering the brain. But as they grow older, all of you are adults now, you shouldn't have any cartilage left in your skull, at least I hope not. It should be completely fused with those fibrous joints and not moving around. Another example we see here in the middle, is that the area between the radius and the ulna, which is our forearm right here, that fibrous material is located between that radius and ulna to keep them together. Even though we can move our forearm, that joint in particular is actually not moving. It's held together by that fibrous joint, those little fibers keeping it in place. And then of course, there's the root of the teeth once again. We don't want those moving around, obviously. The roots of the teeth are held to the gums by those fibrous joints, those immovable fibers.
And you'll see if you ever do your own research, there are different types of fibrous joints as well as cartilaginous. We're not gonna go over those specifically, but we will go over the specific types of synovial joints when we get to those synovial joints. Just a couple more examples. Uh, I'm sorry, here's our cartilaginous joints. Once again, if you remember, the cartilaginous joints are amphiarthroidal, which means they have that limited amount of movement. Obviously our vertebral column, as I talked about, are gonna contain those cartilaginous joints to cushion that spinal cord, keep it safe. Also to keep those actual vertebrae from crushing the spinal cord, it cushions and protects that area as well as offers that limited movement of our spine as we move back and forth. Also the area of the knee where our epiphyseal plates are located are considered cartilaginous joints. Now those will fuse as we get older, that cartilaginous joint will disappear, but as children, where those growth plates are located, that's gonna be considered a cartilaginous joint because it has not fully formed into that solid bone as of yet. Another one would be our symphysis pubis. If you remember, we talked about that last semester, the symphysis pubis is in between those two portions of the pubic bone, keeping it sealed together, but also allowing that limited amount of movement. So let me ask you this, why would we, why would we need the symphysis pubis to be cartilaginous? Why would we ever need that to move? Shouldn't it stay sealed and secure? Shouldn't that be fibrous? For childbirth. For childbirth, exactly, for childbirth. As a baby is born, that symphysis pubis is able to move with that limited amount of movement, limited, limited amount of movement, and allows it baby to pass through the birth canal safely out of the body. And then one more collagenous joint would be the area where our ribs and sternum connect. That's what we call a costochondral joint. The area of the ribs connecting to the sternum is considered a cartilaginous joint. It has limited movement so that we can do what? Breathe. Remember we talked about breathing last semester. That allows us to have that expansion of the lungs and the chest safely. If it did not, then we would not be able to breathe. We'd suffocate on ourselves. So it allows that flexibility of the ribs as we breathe, inhale and exhale. Okay, and then we come to the synovial joints. We will spend quite a bit of time on these synovial joints because we do have multiple categories of types of synovial joints. So once again, when we're talking about movement guys, they are generally completely freely movable or as we classified that diarthroidal, that free range of motion, free complete range of motion on those joints. They are characterized once again by the synovial fluid located in the joint cavities right here. This is that synovial fluid. It's surrounded by what we call a fibrous capsule. That's to keep that, that um, synovial fluid contained within the capsule so it doesn't leak out. Then we talked a little bit about this last time. There's also that hyaline cartilage located there to kind of pad that synovial joint cavity to keep it from breaking apart, keeping all that nice synovial fluid completely encapsulated inside that fibrous capsule. And there's just an example right there of the elbow. The elbow is one of our synovial joints. This would be our joint capsule right here between the humerus and the ulna. It not only cushions that joint to keep the bones from grinding against each other, but it's also gonna allow that free range of motion that we find with that area of the body. So another thing, another reason people go in and get those injections on those arthrograms for that synovial fluid is as that synovial fluid leaves the body, this is all gonna to start to disappear. And if we were to start moving our elbow around, those bones would actually start grinding up against each other. It start to erode away and actually deteriorate. So that synovial fluid is extremely important, not only for free range of motion, but that protection of those bones so that they don't grind up against each other and erode away. Okay, so these are all of our synovial joints that we're gonna talk about today. I have them all color coded here. Here's all the categories we will be reviewing here in just a second. But you do want to make sure as we go through these that you know what actual category each of these synovial, synovial joints fall under. 
because they all fall under various categories. There are six major categories of synovial joints that we're about to review here. Mostly all dealing with our upper extremities, but there are some located in the neck as well. We're going to go over that when we get to it. It's a nice little color-coded diagram here. Definitely something you want to look over and start memorizing. Lots of questions can come from this right here of the actual joints and what category they fall under. But we're going to talk about their movements all specifically as well. What kind of range of motion that they all have, because they all are quite different as we go through them. So once again, there's our types right there. We'll be talking about the ball and socket joint, the hinge joints, the pivot joint, the gliding joint, the saddle joint, and the condyloid joint. All six of these fall under that synovial joint category. They're all fully movable, even though they all have distinct characteristics of how they all specifically move. Now, I do want you to pay attention as we go through. Much like most of the anatomy we've talked about last semester, there are alternative names to these joint types. We're going to go over both names on each of these, and you do need to make sure you know both names. So it won't only be called ball and socket joint, it would also be called a spheroidal joint. So we'll go through that each on each of these specifically. Make sure you do focus on both names for each of these categories. You do need to know both because the registry might use them interchangeably. So make sure we're memorizing both those names on each of those. All right, the very first one is gonna be what we call our plane joints. They go under the name or classification of plane or gliding joints. Why are they called gliding joints? Because they do that exact thing that we're talking about. They actually glide on top of each other. A really great example of these would be the carpal bones in the wrist or the tarsal bones in the foot. As we move our wrist around, those plane joints actually glide over and on top of each other. It allows that range of motion in our wrist as well as our foot. The main type of movement would be side to side and back and forth movements. Side to side and back and forth movements. And that's found in our carpal bones in the wrist tarsal bones in the foot, and also the scapula and the clavicles, all types of those gliding or plane joints. One way I can remember for clavicle that I've always thought of is that the clavicles that kind of look like the wings on an airplane. They're spread out like this, like wings. It's like a plane, airplane, plane joints. That's how I always remember clavicles on that one. Now, I do have some moving pictures here, some GIFs to show you what that movement looks like. It literally glides over each other. It allows that free range of motion on those feet, as you see right here on the right side, but also allows those joints to actually glide side to side, forward and backward, right along each other. So side to side, forward and backward movement, gliding joints or plane joints. Question, Mr. Jones. Say. question. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the only place we can find uh, those joints are in the carpal and tarsal, right? Carpal, tarsal, scapula, and clavicle. Okay. Yeah, carpal, carpal, tarsal, scapula, clavicle. Carpal bones are in the wrist, tarsal bones are in the foot. Scapula are your shoulder blades, clavicles right here. Um, right above your lungs, right above your lungs, like the collarbones. When you say tarsal and carpals, are they the joints in between each carpal bones? Correct. So all these little carpal bones here on the left, all these small little bones in the wrist would all be, um, between each of those would be those planar gliding joints. And if we go to the foot right here, we have all these little tarsal bones in the middle here. Same concept. Those are all the ones that are going to glide on top of each other. So we're not talking about the ankle. That's a different kind of joint. We're actually talking about these tarsal bones right here. All those little small, tiny bones. Those are your tarsal bones. Let me go back a second here. Wrist, the wrist or carpal bones are all the bones located right here. That's what we're talking about. Those are our plane or gliding joints. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is what's called the ginglimus or the hinge joints. 
ganglimus or hinge joints. Where would you find these? You would find these in the elbow and the fingers between what we call our interphalangeal joints, which we'll learn about those next week. They allow that hinge-like movement. They allow movement around one axis, passes transversely through that joint, and the main range of motion that we're gonna have on these joints are flexion and extension. Flexion and extension, we talked a bit about that last semester. So it allows me to bring my forearm like out like so, extending and flexing. If you've ever seen a hinge on a door, it's the same exact concept. It's what's called a hinge joint. But make sure you know that other name of ginglimus joint as well. So those joints on these little diagrams here, that's some of the elbow joint right here, and each of these interphalangeal joints between the parts of the finger right here. So on that hinge-like motion, flexion and extension. So how we can bend our fingers just like this. And also flex our elbow. Mr. Donahue, um, yes. could you say that one more time? Like, I, you kind of froze out in some of between, like right before this. Absolutely, like, absolutely. So our ginglimus or hinge joints are located on our elbow and our fingers. They have a hinge-like motion and they allow us to have a flexion and extension motion. The movement is moving around one axis. It's passing transversely through the joint. It allows me to bring my arm forward and back like this if I'm flexing my arm. Also allows me to bend my fingers at those interphalangeal joints. And these areas I circled right here are where those joints are each located specifically. The elbow and each of these joints on every one of our fingers. Those are called interphalangeal joints. We'll label those more specifically next week. But the main range of motion, guys, is that flexion and extension. Flexion and extension. And this is showing what I'm talking about right here. As we flex that elbow, it's a hinge-like motion. This is a fluoroscopy image on the right, showing you what that looks like on an x-ray. We're flexing and extending that elbow, same concept for those fingers that do the exact same range of motion. As we use a, if we grip our fingers around any objects, we're utilizing that ginglemus or hinge joints. And a great way to study these guys as we move forward is to act them out. When you're studying these on your own time, act out each of these motions as a great way to commit it to your memory. So the third one, guys, is what we call the trochoid or the pivot joint. Call it a pivot joint because it does that exact motion. It pivots on an axis. So this is what we call a unilateral joint. Its key characteristic is it's one bone rotating around one axis. The main range of motion is literally that, a rotation. So the easiest one to remember, guys, would be what? Our neck. The atlanto-occipital joint at our neck, where our C-spine connects to our skull. When I turn my head back and forth, if I'm saying no to something, like no sir, no sir, no ma'am, no ma'am, that is that trochoid or pivot joint action. An actual rotational movement on that axis. Another example would be between the tibia and the fibula. It allows us to pivot or turn our leg, our lower leg specifically, exact same type of joints. That would be located at the ankle, by the way, the ankle and the knee specifically. And you will see as we move forward, some of these joints will overlap some of the anatomy. I'll make sure we point that out because the knee does fall under another category. But that trochoid on the lower leg is going to be located at the knee as well as the ankle. So allow that pivoting or rotational motion. And of course, the neck, like we just talked about. Also, the forearm at the elbow and the wrist allows me to rotate my forearm like so. That's that pivot or trochoid motion. Specifically on that radius and ulna, by the way.
And by the way, guys, since we haven't went over a lot of the joint names, like for example, when we're talking about the elbow and the humerus and the neck, we've got what's called the elantoaxial joint, the radio ulnar joint. So we have not labeled those in anatomy yet. I don't expect you to memorize those quite yet. That will come as we get to each area of the upper extremities where we start actually labeling them. What I really want you to focus on are how these joints move and what they're characterized and named. That's the main thing I want you to start focusing on. Now, I may ask for, for some examples. I might say, what kind of motion does the elbow have? What kind of joint motion you would say, ganglomus or hinge, something like that. But as far as naming the actual joint names like atlanto-occipital, radial ulnar, so on and so forth, we'll get to that as we get to the actual anatomy next week. So focus on those motions and the names and some of the actual journal examples of those body parts. And that's just showing an example right there of that pivot joint. Once again, it allows us to turn our neck from side to side, also allows those twisting motions that we can do with our forearms and with our lower legs as well. Pivoting action, pivot joint, or trochoid. Remember both names, trochoid or pivot. And once again, just to reiterate guys, all these we're going over are all considered synovial joints. Don't forget that detail. These are all examples of synovial joints. Okay, the next one we're gonna talk about is what we call the ellipsoid or the condyloid joints. Ellipsoid or condyloid. So this is close to the fingers. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is the actual joints that we're talking about. It's where the metacarpals connect to the phalanges. So I don't want you to mix this up. These were our hinge joints up here. But below that, more so on the hand in this area right here, is gonna be where those ellipsoid or condyloid joints are located. What are some of the features of that joint? It has an oval surface where one bone is fit into the depression of another. It's gonna allow angular motions of that hand. It's also found at the wrists, our wrist joints. So basically, in layman's terms, this is where our knuckles are located and our wrist is located. That's those ellipsoid or condyloid joints. It allows me to bend my fingers, allows me to move my wrist around in a circular motion. That's how I'm able to do that motion with my wrist. That's an ellipsoid or condyloid joint. So right at the knuckles and right at the wrist is where that's located. It's only like a ball fitting into a depression. It's hard to see this picture right here, but this metacarpal has got a rounded surface right here. It's fitting into an indention on this phalange right here. And of course the wrist as well. And then it allows us to do that with our hand, as you see on that fluoroscopy image right there, but also allows us once again to move that wrist in those circular motions that you see in the image here on the left. So that's an ellipsoid condyloid joint. The main feature is a circular motion of the wrist and the gripping action of the hand at the metacarpophalangeal joints. Not to be confused with those hinge joints, by the way, because it is very close to those hinge joints. So be careful on that. All right, the next one is my favorite one. I love talking about the saddle joint because we only have one. So this is the cellar or the saddle joint and it's located specifically at the base of the thumb. Or if we wanna be super specific, that's the first carpometacarpal joint. We'll label that next week. But specifically the base of the thumb is that cellar or saddle joint. It allows us to have a fully opposable thumb. So the reason I can move my thumb around in a circle like this is due to that cellar or saddle joint. And why is it called a saddle joint? It literally is shaped like a saddle. Two saddles on top of each other to be specifically. If you look at this picture here on the left, looks like we have an upside down saddle right here and a saddle that's right side up below it. They fit together and that's why when I move my thumb, it's able to glide around in the motions that it's able to provide through that cellar or saddle joints. Very large amount of movement for that thumb. 
compared to our other fingers in comparison. It really allows us to move our thumb to basically in any direction we want to move it in without popping out a socket, of course. Don't pop your thumb out of socket. It really hurts. I know from experience. By the way, does anyone here like to crack their fingers? Pop their, pop their fingers? Does anybody know why it makes that noise? Is it like releasing air? Exactly right, releasing air from those joints we're talking about. So those hinge joints, those ellipsoid joints, that saddle joint, anytime you're popping your fingers, you're releasing air out of those synovial cap capsules. And uh, in contrast to the myth you've heard, no, it does not cause arthritis to crack your knuckles. That's like an old wives tale, it's not true. I so why do they say that it's bad to do it? Say what? So why do they say that it's bad to do it? it it's one of those old wives tales that's been passed over generations. Just it's, it's false info though. There's no scientific proof that cracking your knuckles, cracking your fingers does any kind of harm to your body or your joints. So if anyone tells you that, tell them they're, they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Say, I'm just releasing air from my synovial joints. They'll look at you like you're crazy, but hey, you're being scientific. What about the people that keep popping their necks? So, <laughs> I hate that one, by the way. It always gives me chill bumps. No, there's no proof that, that hurts your neck either or your spine. Some people pop their backs. That's all completely normal. You're simply releasing air from the joint space. There's no scientific proof that causes any kind of harm to your joints or the bones. I saw someone go, yes, <laughs> Naomi. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it can be a bad habit, but it's not bad for your body at all. Whoops. Okay, and they're showing that saddle joint action right there. Like I said, it literally looks like two saddles on top of each other linked together. It's located at the base of our thumb, allows that fully opposable thumb, that free range of motion saddle joint or cellar joint. I have a question, Mr. Donahue. Um, sure. So whenever I pop my thumb, I put it from all the way back here. Is that bad? Like all the way no, back not, here? No, 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 that's not bad. You're, you're once again just releasing air from the joints. Even though it's from how you said the base of the thumb? So yep. you wouldn't pop your thumb out of socket there? Or how, how you well, it? if you do it the wrong way, yeah, you could pop your thumb out of socket. But if you pop your thumb out of socket, you're doing something way too aggressively and hard on that thumb. So that's kind of difficult to do. If you pop your thumb out of socket, yeah, um, you might want to take it down a notch. Most definitely. But no, there's, I mean, just a simple pop of the thumbs, that's not going to hurt that joint space at all or hurt the bones at all. Completely normal, completely safe, completely fine. Okay, the spheroidal or ball and socket joints. Main ones in the body are going to be, of course, the shoulder joints and our hip joints. Why is it called spheroidal and ball and socket? It literally looks like a ball fitting into a socket allows for 360 degree full range of motion on those joints. That's why I can move my arms all the way around in a circle, left and right, side to side. That's also how I can walk. I'm utilizing that spheroidal ball and socket joint. Three main planes of movement. It's what we call a multi-axial joint. It allows so much free range of motion. Ball and socket or spheroidal joints. Kind of easy to remember that one. It's got the word ball in it, the word socket in it. It's also got the word spheroidal in it. Can't miss it. Literally describes it within the word there. That's going to be our hip joint and our shoulder joints. And um, Naomi, I believe you helped your, your partner put his arm back in socket not too long ago, yes? You, you put that ball and socket back into socket. That is true. Yeah, it happens to him a couple, every like few months or something, maybe twice a year. I don't know. But it can happen and I got to help him like, whoop, get it back in. It's kind of wild. That happened on my way to class in, in the summer. Thanks for yes. remembering. Yes. <laughs> yeah, ball and socket. Anyone ever dislocated their arm or, or hip before? Not me. Not you. Not me either, but I, from what I hear, it's painful. 
What about my knee? Like, I haven't done that. Oh, we haven't got to knee yet. That's a different kind of joint, but um, you've dislocated your knee? Mm hmm uh, That's was, painful. It's very painful, yes, from what I hear. I don't know personally, but from what I hear. <laughs> it takes a whole week for it to get better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and there's, once again, guys, just showing you that free range of motion. There's the ball literally fit into the socket. It allows me to move my arm in 360 degrees, multiple multi-axial directions. Same with that femur fitting into the hip joint, fitting into the acetabulum to be specific. The head of the femur fits into the acetabulum. The head of the humerus fits into the glenoid fossa. I know it's a lot of big words. We're gonna get to all those this semester as we move on and specify those more specifically. But know that that's a free range of motion, multi-axial, 360 degrees. Ball and socket or spheroidal joints. By the way, I saw my favorite piece of anatomy on the shoulder pop up there. Hang on. Whoops. Oh, I just made a boo-boo. Hang on, guys. I'm sorry. I got excited. I saw my favorite piece of anatomy on there. Does anybody remember? Coracoid. Yes, coracoid. Coracoid, the one I'm always guaranteed to ask you about when it comes to shoulder anatomy. And on the hip, by the way, it's acetabulum. That comes later in the semester. It's one of those fun words, acetabulum. I like those fun words, those nice gram grammar, nice long spelling words. Always fun to say. Okay, the last one we're gonna talk about, guys. So I know I said originally there was six. This joint falls in and out of classification. So we're gonna go ahead and throw a seventh one in there. Um, there's a lot of various arguments in the scientific world of whether this should be considered an official joint or not. We're gonna go ahead and mention it because we do need to know what it is. This is what we call a bicondylar joint or a modified hinge joint. That's primarily found in the knee. And at our TMJs, TMJs is where the mandible fits into the temporal bone. Mandible is right here, that's your jaw bone. It fits into an area of the temporal bone in a little um, hinge-like fashion. Have you ever heard someone that gets locked jaw where they dislocate their jaw? That's the TMJ falling out of socket. That's that bicondylar joint. That's always been something that kind of freaks me out. I always was like scared my jaw would get locked like that. It always gives me um, goosebumps, freaks me out. I always think that'd be one of the worst things that happened to somebody. But that TMJ joint, temporomandibular joint, is what that stands for, by the way. It's a bicondylar joint. It's why we can chew. That's why I'm talking right now. I'm utilizing my TMJs right now as we speak. And of course, the knees, where that femur links up with that tibia and fibula, allows that hinge-like action, similar to our fingers that we talked about. Same concept, but that's going to be that modified hinge joint not the same category as what we talked about earlier. So bicondylar or modified hinge joints, two convex condyles articulating with a concave or flat surface. And it's gonna be a one axis type movement. It'll do a kind of a similar thing to our elbow. We're gonna be able to extend and flex our knee. But once again, it falls under its own separate category. It's that modified hinge or bicondylar joints. Knee joint and TMJs. No one here has ever had locked jaw before? That seriously has always freaked me out. Oh, you've had it before. So was that, was that pretty scary? It's very painful. Yes, it was scary because I couldn't open my mouth and it took like a few minutes before to like, I guess, get back in place. But just like on the sides, it hurts really bad. It's very uncomfortable. Mm. Whew. Yeah, it gives me chill bumps right now thinking about it. I don't know why it is. That's always just gave me chill bumps thinking about that happening. Yeah. If you ever go to the dentist, by the way, guys, if you ever been to the dentist and do x-rays of your mouth, they often look at those TMJs as well because they're looking for the integrity of that joint in case you ever need to get surgery to get those fixed. So if you ever go to the dentist, they're doing those x-rays, they're looking at those TMJs, not only your teeth. You Sometimes when I open my mouth, like my jaw pops. And I think that's how it started the first time when, um, when I, I think I was trying to, I was eating and I don't know what movement I made, and it just locked. Whew. 
Yikes, yikes, yikes. But no issues ever since? It's been, it's been fixed? Uh, no, I didn't go to a doctor or anything. I didn't ask, or I didn't even ask the dentist why oh. it happened. Okay. Um, I actually asked my dentist not so long ago, and they said that's very common in females, especially, really? yeah, um, supposedly it has something to do with the cycle. Really? That's what, that's what, that was their response to me. Um, and it also, if you grind your teeth a lot when you're asleep, that can be one of the causes for that too. I do. I do grind my teeth. I actually wear a, um, a uh, what you would call it? A mouth guard? Mouth guard. No, not, not Nygar. I wear, I wear a night guard because I grind my teeth at night. Yeah. Well, wow, that's actually fascinating. I'm going to have to look that up. You got me curious now. I want to see what the correlation of that is. That's, that's very interesting. I don't know if that's true. That's, that's what the response that they gave me. So. Okay. I'm going to go check that out. You, got, you, you piqued my interest now. I got to go research that. Okay. They're just showing that range of motion once again, guys. There's those TMJs in action, as well as the knee joint, that modified hinge joint or bicondylar joint. Allows those actions you see right there. Is to grind and chew our food, called mastication, by the way. The scientific term for chewing is mastication. Another fun one, by the way, because I, I said to my seniors yesterday, we were talking about digestion yesterday. There's another fun word called deglutition. Deglutition is a fancy way of saying swallow. So if you want to like really make your family look at you really crazy, is say like at the dinner table, like, hey, hey, hold up. I'm masticating my food. I got to deglutitate it. Chill out. They'll look at you like you're insane, but it's always fun to throw scientific words out there. So deglutition is swallowing. Mastication is chewing. If you're a nerd like me, you like to throw those words out at the dinner table, just see people's looks. So. Okay, and there's all of our joints and movement types. One more time, guys. There's our plane gliding, ginglimus hinge, trochoid pivot, ellipsoid condyloid, cellar saddle, spheroidal ball and socket, and bicondylar, I missed the word there, bicondylar or modified hinge. Make sure you commit those to memory. These will reemerge constantly, especially when we start next week getting into upper extremity anatomy. There's quite a few of these joints we're going to start talking about more specifically. And we're going to name the actual names of those joint connections more specifically as well. But make sure you focus on the different types of motion, the examples that were given, and the two names of each of those synovial joints and how they fit as far as categor categorical. So that's the end of this section. One second here. Now, I originally wanted to jump right into upper extremities today, but I do have to duck out early because I got to do some stuff with our move as far as the closing and signing of paperwork. So I will go ahead and end class a little early today, but next week we've got a lot to go over as far as anatomy and positioning, and we're going to hit it very hard. So prepare yourselves. Go ahead and start studying ossification, the joint types we just talked about, the bone development, bone categories all the stuff we talk about this week, because this information is core moving forward when we start getting every piece of anatomy moving forward. Because all these words and terms we talked about, much like the directional terms, are going to reemerge over and over again. I'm going to use them constantly. So make sure you understand them so that you're not lost, especially when we start talking about each of these joints specifically. Because there are a lot of joints that we're going to hit next week, especially in the hand and wrist. And they all have quite complex names that we've got to actually label on our radiographs. So with that being said, are there any questions, guys? Anything I can answer for you? Son, you had a question? I saw you raise your hand. Or were you just stretching? Okay, any questions, guys? I got a question. Yeah. Um, talk, talking about like ossification. So I know there's like the primary center, which is the diaphysis, and then the secondary center, which is the epiphysis. Is that right? Correct. Um, so is that more so, fo again, focus on long bones as opposed to like irregular or flat bones? Yes. Yes. Okay. Even though we can find these on some of the other bones we talked about, primarily we use the long bones as a study because it's much easier to visualize. So same concept we were talking about earlier when we first started. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought so. Thank you.
Yeah, no problem. Any other last minute questions? Anybody else? All right, so as soon as I get off the call here, guys, I will send you the PowerPoints from this morning and today. Start studying this terminology, because like I said, it is gonna come back very fiercely starting next week when we start talking about upper extremity anatomy. All of you have a fantastic weekend. Those of you going to lab, enjoy. And I will see you all real soon. See you on Monday. Bye-bye.